Okay, so welcome to the Molecular Biology of the Gene Lecture. This is the Biotechnology Unit. And biotechnology is definitely a field that is growing and our knowledge is expanding constantly. There's so much that we still do not know about this area of science. Uh, we've come a long way, but just it's uncharted waters a lot of times. There's just some amazing things being discovered all the time when we talk about genetics and biotechnology and molecular biology. Um, so what I want to do is present the basics, what we know, some of the information about the newest discoveries and recent finds, but don't be surprised if there's newer stuff out there that just gets discovered as we're going through the semester or a month after you finish this course and all of a sudden you're like, wow, here's something new that we never talked about. It is just exploding with knowledge and information. And a lot of that is being driven by new technologies being developed. Okay, so we're going to start out with the basics. When we're looking at molecular biology of the gene, we start with DNA. It's the basic genetic material for all living organisms. Now, DNA is composed of three components. Component one is a five carbon sugar. All DNA structures have this basic five carbon sugar associated with it. So when we're looking at it, that five carbon sugar is kind of the center point or the backbone of the DNA structure. So there's our five carbon sugar. The second component Excuse me, is a phosphate group. Okay, so phosphate. Phosphorus, phosphate group, a phosphate with four oxygens attached to it, and then that structure is bonded to the sugar, connecting those two with a covalent bond. And then the third component is a nitrogenous base, a base that contains nitrogen, and this base is adenine. So the official name for DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So when we're looking at it, I want you guys to understand what it is, the basics about it, and what it does. So here's the basic way to remember DNA. You got a sugar house called the sugar shack. Every sugar shack has a chimney that comes off of it. That's your phosphate group. And then every sugar shack has a porch coming off of it, and that porch is your nitrogenous base. Now, when we look at nitrogenous bases, when we talk about DNA, you have four options. A for adenine, T for thymine, C for cytosine, and G for guanine. Those are your four nitrogenous bases <clears throat> available. The example here is showing adenine. We could pull that out and replace it with thymine, cytosine, or guanine. All right, so human beings, we have 3 billion three billion pairs of these things that make up our DNA our genetic code. It has a whole lot of letters that make up our code. Everybody on the planet has roughly three billion pairs of these things inside of their nucleus. That's what gives us our 46 chromosomes. The difference between my expression, my genetics, and your genetics, a lot of it is the arrangement of those bases. What letters do we have? What order are those letters in? That's what expresses our particular traits, or what we call our genes. All right, And that's what we're going to get into with this, this unit in this lecture, is looking at how do we take a gene that we inherited from mom and dad and actually turn it into brown hair, blue eyes, heart disease, cancer, etc. The genes are the code. The DNA is the code of instructions for our life. So we want to look at the history of this. Because where did this knowledge come from? Well, we can stem back to an early scientist named Erwin Chargoff. Back in 19, the 1940s, Chargoff was 
learning about DNA and genetics, and he discovered this thing called the base pairing rule. And what Chargoff discovered was, in the DNA strand, every time you have thymine, every time you have thymine, it should match up. You know, I mentioned they're all in pairs. Every time you have thymine, it should match up to adenine. Adenine should pair up or match to thymine. If you have cytosine, it should pair up and match with guanine. Okay, so Chargoff helped, under, helped us understand this. He figured this out back in the 1940s and helped lay an incredibly important foundation for understanding genetics today. So when we're looking for mutations, diseases, health issues, we look at a piece of DNA, and if you have adenine on the left, you're supposed to have thymine on the right. If you don't, there's a problem. It's an indication something went wrong when your DNA was getting copied and your cell was being formed. Okay, so as with all scientific discoveries, it's not one person who figures everything out. Chargoff played an important role. <clears throat> he laid down that foundation to understand the base pairing, what we call the base pairing rules. But another important historical figure in discovering DNA is this young woman named Rosalind Franklin. Now, this is back in the 1950s. So think about 1950s, a woman in the field of science and biology and molecular biology. Unfortunately, not a lot of respect for women, not a lot of encouragement. So Franklin's worked in a very tough, difficult environment. But she actually took an x-ray of DNA. Now today we think, well, what's the big deal, an x-ray? No problem. Two minutes down at prompt care and I got a picture of it. But this is 1950s. She took a picture of a DNA molecule, an x-ray of the DNA molecule, and from that she was able to figure out that DNA had this helical structure. Now a helical structure means it looks like a corkscrew, kind of this spiral winding staircase or this corkscrew shape. Franklin figured that out. So you take her information along with Chargoff's information and you start to figure out there's this pattern, this shape to DNA. And to understand DNA, you gotta understand the shape. So there's the helical nature. And if you have an A on this side of the helix, According to Chargoff, you should have a T over here. If you have a C on this side, you should have a G over here, and so on and so on for all three billion pairs of our DNA letters. So Chargoff's trying to crack this code. What does DNA look like? What's the full structure and the shape and everything? Franklin's doing the same thing. What's the shape? What's the structure? What's it look like? Well, along come Watson and Crick in 1953. And these fellas are, or get credit for the discovery of the DNA structure. They're the ones who get credit for it. Now the irony, and I, I was told this from a person who was actually there in the 1950s, Watson and Crick never looked, or never did research they worked in the same facility, the same lab, the same school as Rosalind Franklin. But these two guys did not actually take an x-ray. They didn't do experiments. They pulled knowledge and information together and were able to come to this conclusion about the helical structure and the arrangement of the base pairs and all of that. So there's a lot of controversy about this. If you were Rosalind Franklin, would you give up that knowledge? Just hand over, hey guys, here's what the structure looks like. Because that x-ray is pretty critical to understanding the shape of DNA. Now, Chargoff's information, public domain, published, put out there, let people see this. But Franklin's wasn't. And then all of a sudden Watson and Crick cracked the code and figured this out. So the former professor that I knew, who was in the same lab, the same environment, same school, at the same time as these guys, so there was a lot of questions about how did they figure out this helical shape of DNA. So one of those interesting um, situations. Bottom line though, 
all humans have three billion base pairs. Base pairs. That's what make us human beings. That volume of DNA is characteristic of our species. Other species have less DNA, other species have more DNA, but all Homo sapiens, all humans, we have pretty much the same amount of DNA. Now the difference between each of us, this is due to the order of our bases. Okay, so for a particular strand of DNA, you might have A, T, T, C, C, C. The person next to you might have A, 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 C, A, A, etc. So it's not a volume issue, it's an arrangement of letters difference. That's what gives us our uniqueness from one person to the next. That's where you get your genetic uniqueness. Why you're a little bit different than everybody else is because of the arrangement of these bases. Big picture, there's not much difference between us. There's small, little, subtle differences between us when we talk about the letters in our DNA alphabet. All right, so now this is what the general picture of the strand looks like. Over here, we have the sugar backbone, there's our phosphate chimney, and then there's our nitrogenous base. And you stack all these up. The chimney of one hooks to the bottom of the sugar house above it. Chimney, bottom, chimney, bottom, so on and so on. When you go to the other side of the strand, it <coughs> has the same concept, chimney, bottom, chimney, bottom, but it's actually flipped upside down. So what we see is one side of the DNA strand, all of the chimneys are heading in one direction, and on the other side, all of the chimneys are pointing in the opposite direction. So it's what we call, there we go, get that. Okay, <clears throat> so we have so chimneys going one way on one side, chimneys going the other way on the other side. Those bases connect through what we call complementary base pairing, and then what holds the bases together, hopefully this sounds familiar, this is the hydrogen bond, okay? So there's a hydrogen bond that will connect cytosine to guanine, connect adenine to thymine, and so on and so forth, creating the DNA, we call it the DNA ladder. So term to remember, I'll put in red, when DNA replicates, we're going to look at that next, it is known as semi-conservative. But, uh, I'm going to run out of room here. Semi-conservative, because what it means is, and I'll just do it very simply, briefly here. If this is your original DNA strand, two pieces of red, when you replicate, so there's the replication. This top piece acts as a template up here, and now you get a new complementary piece there. That bottom piece right there acts as a template there, and you get a new complementary piece right there. So now you have two new strands, they should be identical because they're using the original backbone or the original red as a template. So it should all be exactly the same. All right, so in our next lecture, I'll load up a little video, walk you guys through the video on DNA replication so you can see how it works, what it does, and then we'll talk about it. And the big thing is, I want you guys to understand what are the key players involved in DNA replication. By and large, these are all enzymes, protein-based structures. So eat your protein, build these enzymes. So you got to eat protein to get amino acids. The ribosome has to build those structures at the rough ER. And then those structures have to do their job and they have to be functioning in the optimal pH and temperature ranges. So again, we'll get into that in the second part of our lecture.